Okay. So um, Beth and Mia, thanks for joining. This is this is now starting year two of our HR 87 Authors Book Club. Um, and so this is our seventh meeting. And as I as I mentioned to you guys, it's sort of organic. It's mostly like a bunch of people who read some books and um, talk about it. And we are, the only organizing principle has been that they're written by classmates. And so far we've been lucky enough to have the authors actually show up um, because it was summer. A couple of our books have been, been long or not too heavy, but um, we thought that it would be sort of fun to do something that was uh, could be read in, in a shorter period of time than, than several of the books that we've read, let's say that. So uh, Mia and Beth are both children's authors and there was a sort of exchange on the main HR 87 webpage where they both connected and said they were gonna get together at some conference. And so I asked if they'd be willing to, to come talk to us and for us to read their books. Um, and they said, yes. And so maybe we could just start with um, Beth, if you could just sort of tell us how you, ended up doing stuff like this and um, some thoughts about that. And then same thing to Mia, and then we'll just open it up to people talking. And, and as we've done before, once we get the preliminaries out of the way, if people raise their hands um, virtually, uh, and then you'll be next in line to ask a question or make a comment and that sort of thing. So Beth, take it away. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm Beth Bacon at Harvard. I was Beth Abati. Um, I've been Beth Bacon now for almost 30 years. So I always forget that a lot of people know me as Beth Abati. Um, and let's see, after Harvard, I became an advertising copywriter. Um, and from there, I traveled a lot because my husband was in the military and I went into high tech marketing and did writing and branding for high tech companies. Um, and I, along the way, always kind of wanted to be a writer, uh, and always sort of put that aside because it wasn't, um, you know, safe and, you know, profiteering. Uh, but on the side, I did a lot of writing. Um, and as I did a lot of writing on my own, I kind of realized that I had just had a really young voice. One of the first things I wrote was this mystery um, thing and my husband read it and he was like why does it sound like this spy is like a 17 year old girl you know I just have a very young voice um, and I love kids and so um, when I decided to um, get serious about writing and sort of use say like this is a personal goal of mine and I'm not going to um, focus on my career anymore I'm going to make my career working as an author I went back to graduate school and I specifically focused in writing for children. And I went to um, Vermont College of Fine Arts, which has a low residency program just for writing for children and young adults. Um, and I went in 2014 and I got my degree in 2016. And since then I have been lucky enough to publish about one book a year, um, which is a lot really. Um, I've been kind of busting my butt trying to, um, just, you know, big publisher, small publisher, self-published. I've tried all of them. Um, so anyways, that's sort of my career history. Um, and that the two books that um, I recommended to read today are books for kids that don't like to read. And those really were based on my two sons who were super smart, but they just didn't want to read. Um, and and so I, uh, when they were in elementary school, I worked in, in their school library. Um, and this was um, the, I Hate Reading was just sort of based on all the inputs of them and their friends when they hated reading. And um, the book that no one wants to read was from my experience of working in the library and seeing like a whole bunch of kids go right to the games and puzzles section because they had to check out a book once a week and they would like, oh, I'll, I'll check out the maze book because ah, it's a book and I don't have to read anything. And, and I wondered like, can I write a book that has a plot 
and has a character who's deep enough to change and have you care about that character, but also have it be a game and puzzle book. Um, and so that's that's sort of the the story behind that one. Right. So I'll turn it uh, over to Mia for her okay. intro. Um, so um, I'm Mia Wenjin and I, I never changed my name. Um, so my author journey is like the polar opposite of Beth's. Um, I was a dorm room entrepreneur um, along with Steve Kapner and John Chuang. Um, and we founded a, you know, ended up being sort of a staffing solutions company that's now like 35 years old. Um, and so I, I did like startups and entrepreneurial stuff. Um, I went to business school at UCLA along with um, Tommy McMillan. And I think Lawrence Wolf was our year too. I think there were like three or four Harvardy, maybe not all our year. Um, and then, you know, just kind of like use my entrepreneurial marketing degree um, to do like, yeah, different startups, both for my company. And then I did other things on my own. But then when I got, when I had my second child, so um, she's 21 now. My husband said, um, if I have to stay home with two kids, I will be forced to leave you. So we switched we switched roles and I was a stay-at-home mom and he went back to work. And, you know, when my oldest, who's now 23, was in first grade, um, she like the whole grade got it was a K-1 and she got really behind because um, the teacher had a chronic illness. And so we had like subs for subs. So I was doing all this work to catch her up. I didn't, I didn't even know like what she didn't know. And so I ended up blogging on it. So I, basically my third child was like five. I had him in preschool five days a week for three hours a day. And I was like, woohoo, I have so much time. I like should start something. So I started a blog and it was like about education and literacy. Cause that's what I was like math and literacy to catch my daughter up on. But then I started doing book lists because my kids are half Korean, a quarter Japanese, and quarter Chinese. So I did like a Japanese American list, Chinese American, Korean American. And the Korean American like went slightly viral. Like all my Korean friends were like, oh, thank you for the list. I bought every single book on it. And then I told 20 of my Korean American mom friends and they, they're all buying the books. Um, and so I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll just do book lists. I was reading a lot, like 30 or 40 picture books, you know, a week. No, actually more like 70 to, to 100 picture books a week with my kids to catch my oldest up on literacy. Um, and um, then like maybe like one, two years into blogging, I saw the study by Lee and Lowe, which is like a mid-sized publisher. They focus on diverse books that said the number of diverse books hasn't changed in 14 years in publishing. And I was like, and this is like, yeah, this is like 10 years ago. And I was like, what? Like, that's crazy. Like I had growing up in Southern California, I had just gone to like my goddaughter's birthday party. It was like 10 and like 19 out of the 20 girls were mixed race. So then I just put out there, like, I'm just going to focus on diverse books because I feel like people just don't know like which are the good ones, you know? Um, and so then another blogger friend, because there was like a whole group of like children's book bloggers and we saw all sort of grew up together, reached out and said like, we should meet to talk about, you know, this, this issue. And we ended up starting a nonprofit, which was called Multicultural Children's Book Day. And now it's readyourworld.org, um, where we would give, like we would get books donated directly to reviewers, which were book bloggers then. Um, and that way we would sort of raise the profile of the book. Um, and so, you know, sort of like in this world, you know, promoting diverse books, reading about them. Um, I had like 250,000 followers on social media across all platforms as a blogger um, and just, you know, just trying to let people know, you know, trying to change the industry the way the tail wags the dog, because there were other groups that were trying to change publishing itself by saying like, you know, you need to have more, you know, diverse editors, but, you know, as a marketing person, you know, you just follow the money. So if we could show that diverse books sell as well as mainstream books, you know, they're going to follow the money. Um, so that, that's what we focused on. Um, and then just over time, yeah, I would get these like random emails, like, because my whole thing was like, if you, if you need to find a book, just let us know, we'll make a list for you. We'll find a list for you. You know, um, I'll Google search for you. 
So I would get all these like, you know, do you know a Native American middle grade fantasy book? And I'll be like, in fact, I do. Do you know a uh, Latinx, you know, whatever, whatever. And I'll be like, yes, I do. And then one day I got, do you know uh, Asian American, you know, um, nonfiction biography? And I was like, oh, I had just written a book because my oldest child was at the RISD pre-college and she was an illustration major. And her assignment was she had to create a picture book and she was commuting from Boston, which was like literally like a four hour commute every day. And she was falling asleep on the train and missing her stop. And like, she just wasn't getting any sleep. So when she said this was her assignment and she went to like Asian American notables, I was like, you know, A to Z alphabet book. I was like, I'll just research it for her. Um, and that, cause it's really an illustration project and she can, you know, paint and then she would get a little bit more sleep. So I, I did it. And I was like, here you go, A to Z. And she was like, I can't use that. That's cheating. So I was like, it's not, but okay, whatever. So I, I just, so I just wrote and I just finished it. I just, I was like, maybe she'll illustrate it for me, which she did not. Um, and so what, when this inquiry came by, I was like, oh, I have a manuscript. And so I ended up writing this book, um, Asian Pacific American Heroes for Scholastic, just through a book packager. So I was just like fee based and it's only sold through the um, book fairs and the flyers. Um, and at the same time, I had taken a, like literally a picture book writing class at like my local high school, you know, a, you know, community education. But I was really lucky because we had these three amazing illustrators in my class who like decided we're all just going to take this class together. And, um, and so like we all kind of had books that came out from that class. Janie Ho, who was, you know, like thirty books illustrated for Candlewood Press and Jen Benton, who's also an amazing illustrator. And then they had a friend who was like new illustrator of the year, you know? Um, so I, um, so I wrote Sumo Joe for that class thinking like, oh, you're going to need a manuscript, which actually you didn't need it done. And then sort of at the midnight hour before I went on vacation, I entered it into the Lee and Logo competition, which, you know, which were the people who did that survey. Because I, you know, at that point, I didn't really know how to write a query letter and it didn't require a query letter. And my middle daughter was like, I think it should be a book. You should just, you know, you should get it published. And so, um, so I asked people like, raise your hands if you think I won that, you know, new voices competition. So I did it. I actually did not win. I lost. But I got a letter that said, oh, we liked your book. And would you like some free editorial? Um, and I was like, yes, I would, actually, because I have no idea what I'm doing. Because um, I was a history and science major and pre-med in college. Um, and so, I, so we spent like six or nine months doing multiple drafts. And then they, they, they gave me an offer to publish it. So that was my debut picture book. And it came out in 2019. And it came about because as a book blogger, you know, I'm just seeing all these, you know, book trends and I'm seeing ninja book after ninja picture book. And I'm like a little bit, of, like, I, I think ninjas are cool, but I'm like a little bit annoyed because it's like ninjas in a very stereotypical way. And I was like, okay, the, the book publishing world, you know, like it's like three years out, you know, it takes at least three years for a picture book to come out. So I was like, okay, you, you, you know, what's adjacent to ninjas? And I was like, sumo, because everyone thinks they know sumo and everyone loves sumo. They think it's so funny, fat men diapers, but, you know, also stereotypical, you know, racist version of it. So, so I wrote it as more of like to respect it as a sport and as a religion and to introduce, you know, Aikido and, you know, sort of like girl empowerment because sumo traditionally had been a, like a male only sport. Um, and then sort of like, you know, like during this period, my middle child, uh, the one that I went stayed home for, when she was in high school, like she played a lot of sports and she was like, there are no Asian American female athletes. And I was like, what? Like, you like Chloe Kim, like Chloe Kim's awesome. She was like, okay, Chloe Kim, but that is it. And I was like, no. Um, and so I ended up writing this book, Changing the Game. And really, I didn't know how to write middle grade, but like I learned how to write middle grade anthology, you know, biography from, from the editors I worked with at Scholastic and also the, the, um, the book passion company. So I just mirrored it. Um, and this was like right, right at the beginning of the pandemic and Asian American females were being literally attacked and killed. So my agent was like, oh, we should see if we can get like, 
a publisher to publish it, i.e. Scholastic. And so we tried and tried and tried and tried. And they were like, no, this is like a series where like first it was Native American and you're Asian and then we'll probably do Latinx and like, yeah, you know, we got we like, yeah, that's enough. So I ended up just doing a Kickstarter. I just kickstarted it just to publish it. Um, and then like literally in January, Scholastic ended up buying reprint rights. And that's only because of Joe Bay, who's like five or six years younger than us, who started this whole Asian American nonprofit. And um, he sort of led the charge to get all these different states to put Asian American history in the school system. And so Scholastic was just reacting to that because they want now a library for that. So thank you to Joe Bay. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of my writing journey. I um, ended up like, like, because I'm not, honestly, I'm not the best writer in the world. Like I was like, I took like one English class. Um, but like, I kind of use my marketing skills to see, because I'm also like, I'm making, like I have 3000 posts on my blog and like a third of them are book lists. And I have a book resource for my nonprofit, which is all book lists across every kind of category. So I'm able to kind of see where the holes are. So when I see there's a hole, I'm like, oh, oh that would be, you know, like, oh, I, that's something I care about. That's something I would want to write about. Um, and then I can sort of, you know, fill that gap. Um, and that's kind of how my newest book came about, which was, it's um, about sustainable farms around the world. So I had written a picture book about um, good luck symbols around the world. And, you know, I actually got like a couple of editor inquiries. I got like two editor meetings out of it. Um, and so one editor was like, I really like your book and I want to get it published, but sales and marketing said no because you know, we're a small publisher and there's no real holiday to hang it around, but like, let's meet. And we like your format, which is like, you know, couplets, um, like very simple. Um, and let's see, if there's a different topic. So I, it was Barefoot Books, which is in Concord, which is like two cities over from me. And like, I've known them forever because they were, you know, I would go to the, all their book events. I covered all their books. Uh, they were a longtime sponsor of mine for my nonprofit. Um, and so I, so I knew they cared about sustainability um, because I had just reviewed like, you know, sustain like sustainable energy and like, you know, water. Um, and so when I said sustainable farms, they're like, oh yeah, we love it. And so like literally <laughs> two weeks later, I was like, here's the manuscript. And then they said, we'll have that book out in one year, which is really crazy fast. And it, it, it probably was more like, uh, like 17 months when it came out, start to finish. Um, but still incredibly fast. And I think just because, the, you know, there's a lot of books on farms, but not that many on sustainability. I was lucky I got the Junior Library Guild, uh, like gold selection, which um, it puts you in 1200 libraries, like the minute, like the books come off the press. And then I got uh, my first star reviewed ever with School Library Journal. And then I got like, yeah, I got like this, like, depict, it's like, where I remember, it's, it's like a, publishing platform called Depictus. So they picked it as 100 emerging picture books in the world. But then it got showcased at the Bologna Book Festival as part of that selection. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I um, like I'm a prolific, like I'm, I'm cranking out the books pretty quickly of manuscripts. So I sold six books last year, um, including the one, like the one that went like, this came out in June through Scholastic. I sold five more picture books that are coming out like two at a time for the next um, three years or two years. And then I have like 10 more picture book manuscripts that um, are going like, are on schedule to make the rounds of submissions. So yeah, it's- uh, Great, cool. So, um, well, you know, Tom already has a question in the in the chat, but um, maybe we'll just go. Why don't, Tom, why don't you just summarize your question and see who can answer? Sure thing. Um, can you hear me? I haven't tested my mic yep. yet. Okay, yep. great. So, uh, you know, as a writer, all sorts of writers ask me for advice on breaking in or whatever. And a lot of them are writing children's books and I have no clue you know, on that path in traditional publishing? How, how would you write that? And my brother writes middle grade, but his thing was so particular, he has no clue. So if I'm asked this again, 
by somebody, which I'm sure I will be. How, what, uh, and this Tom, is can I jump I in and ask you a question? Um, yeah. So you say people ask you, um, yeah. do you do something that you encounter a lot of like sort of writers or creative people and, uh, or are you just saying that as like, I am asking for a friend and it's really you. No, who no, 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 not for me. Tom, not for, Tom's got a, a five or six or seven published fantasy sci-fi books, right, Tom? Yeah, and definitely not for kids. Right, so, no, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that I got, uh, so, and it seems a very different path, you know, I mean, more so, I mean, I'm asked romance, I'm asked all, you know, writers that, People who are just trying to break in will ask a writer and assume they know the whole landscape. And I just, there's one part of the landscape that I really, really don't know. And that's, you know, children's book. I, I mean, I have some clue on when you get up to YA, but middle grade, uh, forget it. I have no idea how that someone would go about that. And I had particularly no idea how someone would go about that right now. So if I'm ever hit with this question again, besides saying, oh, you should talk to my classmates, um, do you have some answers? I would say <laughs> it's the hardest to get published in children's books because there's, you know, and it pays the worst. So if you can write other genres, I would encourage that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, but it's it's actually, I would say maybe the answer is the same in a parallel way, like if somebody wants to write romance or sci-fi, you really have to understand the genre and you have to know the tropes and you have to know what editors expect and want. Um, and the same is true with books for young readers. Although it's very, there are very specific categories. So a picture book has a certain format and expectations early reader has a certain format and expectations in terms of um, sentence structure even and how complicated the story is and how much the characters, um, how they relate to each other, like where they are maturity wise. So like your book has to match maturity wise with the maturity of the reader. Um, so I would say that like the person has to just super do a deep dive into whatever subgenre of children books they they want to write about and know really all about kids that age what's out there now what they're expecting uh and then what the format of the story structurally is expected by the publisher so you have to know that's why it's so hard to break in um because like it's really easy when people show me oh i want to write children's book and they show me the manuscript and i'm like okay, go go to the library and just read a ton of books or go to the, even better, the bookstore because those are the new ones and it takes months or years for those new books to, to filter into the library. Um, so I would just say like, know your category deeply. And I learned that by getting an MFA. Um, that was like, I do really well in school environments. And so I was like, I know that this will help me. It'll force me to do it and I will learn super deeply. Sounds like Mia learned sort of from the other perspective. She sort of learned about the business of publishing and then found where the holes are and said, this is this is where I can put my experience in, in where there is a need. Yeah, but I, agree, mean, I, Mia? I, I mean, I've read thousands and thousands of books as a book blogger. I mean, I just, I get, I mean, I get piles, you know, just, they're just, so I, I, what I tell people is like, if, like, if you, if you have a picture book manuscript about a dog, go read 100 picture books about dogs and publish in the last five years. Um, and cause then you'll see, like, you'll see what got published, what's good, what's bad. And also is your book story redundant, you know, because backlist or front list, like we don't really need a second good night moon. We already have good night moon. You know what I mean? So I think that placement, you know, is what every editor does and every author should do when they first start to like figure out their idea is you do like a uh, like a book comparison. Yeah. yeah. And what I did, um, like 
I love to go to art museums and that whenever I go there, I see like art students copying paintings. And I'm like, oh, children's books are not that long. I literally copied um, my favorite children's books and figured out where the paginations were, figured out where the page turns were, where the chapters were, what the structure was. So I like copied them and dissected them and understood them. And then once you know them super, super deeply, you can either use that as a model or just totally break it. Like my book, I Hate Reading, literally has no plot. And it's it still works as a story, but like it's on purpose, not like other books, because that structurally it is exactly what the message of the book is. Um, so that's why it works. So you just if you just know stuff super, super deeply, then you can like jump in and, and start creating in that genre. So so once you have a book manuscript, you feel like it's good and it's unique, then you can submit. So you can submit on your own. There are like there's a list out there of all the publishers who don't require agents. And, it, you know, it's a fairly good list. Like there's a fair amount of people. And then you can write query letters. And there's there's different like websites that show you what each, you know, um, like editor like what's on their wish list. So you, you can just do a ton of research and then submit. You can meet editors if you go to conferences. A lot of them will have like, like a book critique portion. Sometimes you have to pay extra for that, but that will allow you to get in front of an editor. And usually from that conference, you're allowed to submit your um, manuscript to even editors who are agent only. And then of course you're set up now because you're writing query letters to write query letters to get an agent. And I've noticed it can be harder to get an agent than it, it is to get published. So, oh, it's hard to do all of it. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Every but I step know of the way. Like spent so nine hard. years getting an agent and then nothing happened. And then like three more years getting the agent, a new one, because the first one didn't couldn't sell anything. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, sold, you know, a dozen books. So wow. yeah, you don't have to have an agent, but yeah, you it, it is very helpful. But on the other hand, an agent is like, it seems so like, oh, they're so rarefied, but honestly, they're just like a person who sends your books out like administratively with a letter. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not, it, and there, there's no designation, there's no training. It's sort of like you can raise your hand and say, it, you really only just need a database of editors with email addresses, honestly. Um, I know there's other questions, but I just wanna finish this answer by, I wrote in the chat, there's a group called SCBWI, which is very awkward, but that actually is the go-to place for conferences and education about children's books. I had beef with them, so I don't recommend them anymore, but on my blog, I have alternative ones, particularly for uh, minority, like if, you have, if you're in a minority marginalized group. I sat on their diversity committee and they do not support diversity. Really? That's that's something I didn't know about. That's too bad. Oh. Okay, so other questions. Laurent, you're up. Yes. Um, wow, that was so, so super interesting, both your stories. So although originally I was going to ask you about the stories, there's something because of stuff that's been happening over here I wanted to ask you both about. So with the... I know from friends who are children's writers that one of the things they have struggled with is the, oh, it's super easy. Anybody can write a children's book. Therefore, X celebrity will write this book. On top of that now is the whole AI question. And I've been on lots of panels recently where I've run into like the society of authors and the illustrators and they are all freaked out and worried and I think part of that worry comes from is that in sectors like like mine and yours where people go oh anybody can do that because anybody can do that let's get a machine to do it so I just love to know what you both think about what's happening with AI? Do you think it's a threat? Do you think it's not? Do you think it's a particular problem for children's books? Um, yeah, I just like to hear what you think. So I think that both of those um, issues stem from the same assumption that um, because our audience are young people, 
um, they are not complicated and thoughtful and deserving of um, really s smart work. And I have seen stuff also like, oh, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna get AI to make a picture book about zoo animals. And then, yeah, that you can do that. And it will be like zoo animals are, there's tons of knowledge about them in, you know, the databases of the web and, and you can pull out and make a rhyming story about zoo animals. And, and, and that to me is like, well, anyone who knows anything about like the real quality children's books, that's not where they are. Like the, that's not what really is is happening in in children's books that are thoughtfully made you know and so i just i just see it as an example of disrespect for books for young people in general um, so um, oh i'm sorry are you done no go ahead so with regard to like the celebrity books i mean you know anyone who has a million instagram followers you know, and can write a decent book, can sell, you know, can make the New York Times bestseller for children's books. And Plus the celebrities get ghostwriters, by the way. But, but, but they're looking for their marketing. I mean, you know, right. So at the end of the day, it's like, it's easier to publish a book than it is to sell a book um, and have the book earn out. So a picture book costs $30,000 to make. That doesn't include overhead of like editors and sales staff and marketing people who are already, you know, overhead. And so that's a lot of books you have to sell at full whack just to break even, right? $30,000. Um, and so, um, so yeah, celebrities who have that kind of reach can sell a lot of books. And so then the book doesn't have to be as good, you know, but, you know, it's a business. So it's, you know, it's fine. And every now and then they write a great book. So, you know what I mean? But the bar is lower for sure. Um, and as long as they prove they can keep selling the books, they're going to keep getting that opportunity. With regard to AI, I think it's just, especially with this whole trend towards diverse voices and lived experiences, I think it's very hard for a um, for AI to like really replicate like a lived like 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 Watercrest just won the Caldecott, and that is like a deeply personal story of poverty and being ashamed of your culture, um, and you know it, it, and it was Andrea Wang's like. She was inspired by um, a previous book that was a Caldecott honor book um, that talked about poverty, like Asian poverty. And so I, I, I think if it's just sort of a generic-ish, you know, series, I, I mean, yeah, you can use AI and it would be quicker. But um, at the end of the day, it's a little bit different for publishers because you need, you need the creator to be front and center to sell your book. I mean, you know what I mean? You're not, because, because you know, we have to, we have to go out there and like slog it through, you know, on social media and doing events and going to classrooms. It's not, it's not just, we make a book and the publisher, you know, does all this work. To, I mean, they spend like maybe three weeks on your book um, and then, you know, they have the next book, you know? So unless AI can prove it's like a New York Times bestseller, which, you know, it is possible, you know, you you still like the burden, the burden is on the children's book creators. Like we don't have to just write and illustrate, like we have to move that book. Even if we're not marketing people, you know what I mean? The burden is still on us. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's fine. I mean, the diversity question is a big issue with AI, as you probably know. Um, and one of the points that I was in parliament recently, and it's one of the points that I brought up is AI works off of stereotype. It is just the average of the data that shoved in there. And that is completely against diversity of any sort. But, um, but yeah, it's really heartening to hear what you say. And um, I will think about that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, interested, Laura. What what it, what brings you to that angle? What do you do, and where's your expertise? Oh, so I'm I'm an actress and a voiceover artist um, okay. based in London, and I also happen because I'm a Harvard student. I did the master's in computer science for shits and giggles, and um, so I am knowledgeable about. I, I'm programmed in machine learning all that, but my day job is I do funny voices. And um, 
sometimes play dying people. Um, but because in the UK, everybody's very siloed because you stop doing subjects so young, having somebody with a foot in both camps is very unusual. Uh, and so my union keeps pushing me out to do all the talking to people about about what's happening with you know because it's a very long story but Rishi Sunak because this country is going to hell in a handbasket Rishi Sunak is like oh come set up your AI here we're not going to change the technology the the law it'll be fine and I was part of a panel to parliament going no it's a problem because they're stealing our voices and and the, and the point I was bringing up is that when you use AI on the entertainment industry, which is art and it's about the whole range of gamut and experience and diversity, when you use AI, you're going back down to the white guy because there are more of them and we're just the outliers. So, so we study AI from the staffing side too. And, um, and our take is AI is a tool. So like we all have to learn how to use it as a tool. And like Mid Journey is a good example of like computer generated illustration because right now like graphic novels are it's like skyrocketing like the demand is unquenchable um but that you know but the creators are like it, it's so expensive it's it, it pays so poorly because i have to make you know 300 like image like drawings for this but i could see ai if you're the creator you create your cast of characters you create your settings and then use ai to create you know those 300 plus panels that you need. So it's it's still your creation. You know what I mean? It's just quicker. If you're allowed to use it. Well, it's, so you're like the illustrator. But somebody from the Society of Illustrators were not, was on one of these panels I was on and they said the problem is like, they'd heard about advertising agencies that were using AI to storyboard instead of hiring illustrators. So, they were using the, see, this is the basically the problem, what I mean about owning it. So some of my colleagues have had their voices taken and are now being sold on these AI voice websites. So they are competing with themselves. They were not asked permission and they're not getting any money from it. Yeah, no, that part's bad. So, but it, and that's the problem. So I see, I see what you're saying. So like, if I were controlling it, you know, if I were Stephen Fry and I could say, look, I'm too busy to do these five jobs here. I will do an AI version of my voice. I will get some money from each of these and then I can go up. Great. But it's, it's, they're taking people's work and then selling it without remunerating those people. Right. Who's it's taking. basically like a copyright trademark issue. So if you yeah. protect the rights of the creators, you know, even like a writer, if you're like, I'm writing middle grade and I'm going to use it to help me draft. And then it's like really my first draft. Like if you're the creator, you use it for your own benefit to speed up the process because, you know, your, your money is time is your, you know, money is time. Then like that, that's how we also should look at it as a empowerment tool and then protect that, yeah. protect that asset. Cause that's our, still our work, even if it was, you know, the same way, like, handwritten versus typed versus word process you know it, it got faster but it's still our own work you know what I mean I know and I think the difficulty in the UK anyway is that the legislation doesn't protect us which was one of the reasons why I was screaming at parliament um we have to sign away our rights did they, did they number let, one. Lawrence did, did they let you scream I know they scream at each other do they let you scream? they actually did I think they were really shocked um <laughs> I mean, because I'm a foreign national, I don't do any of the sir, madam, kowtow, whatever. I was like, you're going to listen to me and you're going to listen to me now. Um, anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to hijack the discussion, but it is, I, I, I think this is the problem in the arts is absolutely me. If I were in control of it, it'd be great, but I'm not. And our rights have been taken away and taken away and taken away over the years. And this whole AI issue has just highlighted that. And I know that some of my writer friends and some of my illustrator friends are worried because their normal tick over work. Companies are now going, we don't need you. We'll just do an AI. And I think that's where the, that's where the problem comes in. It's a very complicated issue. But it is interesting to hear your view on it because that's a new one that I haven't heard yet that it could be positive in that way. 
Great. Um, Lisa. Oh, there okay, you. so something totally different. <laughs> um, I wonder what your favorite uh, books were as children, and do you feel they still stand up? Um, and, you know, for example, did you read them to your children? Would you read them to the next generation of kids? And if not, what are you looking for now? Okay, so I'll, I'll start because I read every single book, every middle grade book, every biography in my elementary school library, like fourth, fifth, sixth, it like took me two and a half years. And I never saw a character that looked like me, you know? Um, and so I, I have, I've had, you know, literally read that, you know, everything. So I had tried to get my kids to read stuff um, that I love. And most of the time it, it misses. Like they liked All of a Kind family. So, and then we made this whole push to get All of a Kind back in print because there was only like one book in print. Um, but in general, there was like, it just, they, my kids did not connect with it. Um, and, and, so, and so the books I liked were, I mean, I remember like reading The Wizard of Oz thinking like, oh, I didn't know there was a whole series. And like um, that, like, uh, like, you know, even like Lord of the Rings and Harriet the Spy, like, I, you know, there were so many great books, um, but literally, and, and, that, and that's kind of how I came into diverse books because, you know, it affected me not to see myself in books or on TV or in the movies. Yeah, and I would jump on that. Some of my favorite books were were the ones about people who were kids whose lives were so different than mine, like Julia the Wolves, which may be problematic because it was written by a white man, but um, <laughs> it was about a little girl in Alaska. And, um, you know, it was this intense story of her running away from home and like being taken care of by wolves. Um, the book that really affected me, I read in the fourth grade was called Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. Do any of you guys remember that? It was a book that like- I recorded that. Oh, you did? Oh, I recorded that like, as an audio book. Yeah. To me as a child, it's basically about a family that finds the um, fountain of youth and the little girl has to decide, do I drink from that and live forever or do I not and, and know that I'm going to die? at some point and she chooses um, spoiler she chooses chooses not to and I remember reading that and just feeling like I didn't know how scared I was of death and that that book comforted me um and I was like wow that's super powerful I want to do that when I'm a grown-up um do you guys remember that and and the other one of course is Wrinkle in Time which I'm sure everyone in our age group loved um, although I thought that they had a really problematic ending, it sort of like fell apart at the end, but we loved the beginning so much. Um, and I do, I do think that a lot of books that we read as kids are really problematic now. Um, some of them like, sorry, Harriet the Spy is really boring now. It's just like books today don't have that much like blah, 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 blah without action. And um, Books like Little House in the Prairie, like or Caddy Woodlawn, yeah. those are problematic. Yeah, yeah, they just have like really like not okay opinions of Native Americans and you know the patriarchy and all that stuff. So um, it is very interesting. Um, although you know, I still think that there is a place for reading them as long as you can discuss things with the kids in a really open way about things are different now. Why are things different now? How is it different for you? How did that make you feel when you read those sections that are problematic? So like, I'm kind of pro, like, let everybody read everything as long as with children, you have to like guide their discussions. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot of time spent on the discussions of the books out there. Tuck Everlasting yeah. like in a sign book in our, our middle school, like the whole grade. Recently. Still? Yeah, still. Today? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or like when my kids were in middle school, which was like eight yeah. years ago. Sort yeah, sort of, so. sort of recently. Yeah. yeah. And I have reread that and I, I still think it holds up. Um, so yeah, it's very I, I philosophical. A, I, so there's a question from Charlotte. So, um, so I don't know Joe Bay personally, 
but I'm part of the um, Asian American, Harvard Asian American Alumni Association, like H, H4A. Um, and we're like pretty active. Like we have a Boston branch as well. And so someone did like a same type of Zoom meetup where they interviewed him for an hour. And so I, I, I watched that and, and basically heard his story, which was when people were getting murdered for being Asian, like grandparents in San Francisco and New York during the pandemic, his kid said, dad, you have to do something. So he said, okay, it's also kind of slow. He, he basically rallied up his other Asian Fortune 500 CEOs. You know, there's like five of them, but he got them all in the room because, you know, everyone's not busy now. And they raised over a billion dollars um, just amongst themselves. And then they parceled the money out to Asian American nonprofits that they knew. And then they decided to start their own nonprofit because they said, you know, there's NAACP, there's, you know, ADL, there's like, there's groups for every minority group, but there's not one for Asians. So they started one for Asians and plunked in, you know, a huge chunk of money from the money that they raised. And part of that money was used to hire lobbyists in, I think in every state to lobby for Asian American history in the public school system, because they felt that if Asians were part of the history curriculum, we wouldn't be seen so much as foreign and as dangerous and, you know, be attacked. Um, and because of that, he, he like, you know, like a few years later, there's like seven states. It's like, like Illinois was the first and New Jersey and New York and California. I mean, even like Texas is considering it in 2025, which is crazy. Uh, but they got like seven or eight states, but like the momentum is kind of growing. And so once it's mandated in the public schools, like, you know, they don't really know what to do with that. Like, you know, K through 12, like how are you supposed to put in like mandated? And so Scholastic then was like, we're just gonna, you know, make a, a library. And so we're either gonna use our own titles or we're gonna get reprint rights. So then they tried, so they, so they, they decided, so they went out and they, you know, got all reprint rights, including mine, which they had rejected for three years. And then they wanted reprint rights for this book, Love in the Library, which is a Japanese American internment story. Um, and Maggie Takuda Hall, I don't know her personally, but she wrote a fairly accurate and aggressive author's note about the racism that Japanese Americans faced. Um, and Scholastic, which I don't think they did for any other book, said, we would like to reprint your book, but we would like you to change your author's note and like basically tone it down. And I'm sure they're thinking like, we can't sell it in Florida. We can't sell it in, you know? And so she understandably and rightfully was like, hell no, am I gonna do that? So she put it on the social media. Can you believe that this is what Scholastic asked me to do? And it was this huge thing on, in publishing and social media. And um, Scholastic had to backtrack and say, the president had to come out, CEO, and say, like, oh, uh, we're so sorry. We don't normally do that. But obviously, like, they didn't fire anybody. Like, that was sort of like the expectation to build this library. And then they said, oh, because this is published by Candlewick Press, which is another really great publishing company in Somerville, like so one town over from Cambridge. Um, and then and then they asked her like, oh, oh, now we changed our mind, you can print it as is. And she was like, hell no, I'm not, I'm not gonna let you do that. And um, yeah, and so it's, like- It's actually really, really interesting that children's books right now are at the heart of all these big national political issues. Um, and I think the American Library Association and many publishers and tons and tons of writers uh, and illustrators are are holding their own, you know, and 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 sticking sticking out there. And, and like it's it's really like I wouldn't have thought, you know, back in 2014 when I first went to get my MFA in writing for children that this is what would happen in, in the children's industry. I write for children because my voice is young and I and I really think that children deserve complicated interesting um multifaceted stories you know I respect kids and um boy it really has become this you know battleground for political 
stuff, you know? And, um, and it's affecting, if you have a banned book, in, in earlier days, like before all of this, you, you know, like you get on the banned book list, it's like a badge of honor. It helps your book sell. But now these lists are so extensive and, you know, the buyers are so like nervous, understandably, that like, like authors are saying, like I, my royalty has been slashed. Like I'm making no money now. Um, and so it, it is, it is hurting. It is hurting like lots and lots of people. Um, so it's- uh, Oh, in the, um, sorry, I probably interrupted. Charlotte had a follow-up. Author said, hell no. And then, and then like she, so, she did so not contribute she, her, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So she's not, she's not letting Scholastic reprint it, but you know, it's still available through Candlewick Press. And it like, it, it, like it sold out. Like they had to, you know, they were like no books for sale. Like they sold out whatever they had printed and they're going to print more. So, um, and she's sort of like, like she went from being, I, that might've been her debut picture book. Sort of like, oh, it's a book that, I mean, cause I literally was talking to um, Read Across America, like the person who picks the Read Across America list because we do a collaboration with my nonprofit. And she asked me like, what do you think about that? And I was like, I think it's a great book. I, I you know, I just think there's too like there's too many Japanese American stories that are around internment, but I think that one's really good. And she was like, I'm kind of on the fence because you know maybe it's just like another internment story. And this is like over a year ago, but now it's like that story and that author is front and center, um, and that's like permanent. You know, it's like permanent recognition. So kudos to her for sticking to her guns. It elevated her. You know, like there's almost like no there's no such there's no such thing as like bad press and it wasn't even bad press um and now she's got more books coming out and now we're all like we're all behind her like anything she ever writes we're like support Maggie you know because it was it was a lot of courage just to stand up to Scholastic um Charlotte has two follow-up questions did Scholastic pick your book Mia yes I mean like so like my agent sent it to them like in 2020 multiple times to the editors that we worked with and they were like, no, thank you. And then I would say last August, I got an inquiry from a Scholastic, like a, acquiring editor for that, for, like, uh, like for reprints that said, oh, we're, is it okay we consider your book? And I was like, yes. And then nothing happened. And I noticed a bunch of books came out like, you know, like, oh, we got reprint rights. And I was like, oh, I guess they rejected it because it is very specific. And then January, I got another another email from a different Scholastic acquiring editor, which is which is not like from scratch, but just like for reprint rights. And they were like, "Oh, can we consider your book?" And I was like, "Yes, you can." And then they're like, "Here's the contract," which is not a great contract, but I I now get royalties. But um, so I, I think I think as they realize the number of states are getting bigger and bigger, they just wanted a bigger library of books, you know. So then they're like. I will take it like, you know, if it, if it fits, you know what I mean? Like it fits the criteria, it's, you know, it's as if we would have made it. I mean, there's no typos and whatever. Um, and they're like, why not? Like we can get it really cheap and just add it to the library. So I think that's what happened. So, um, and yeah, so Maggie's book is sold out, you know, like they had to do emergency reprint and everyone knows about it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, doing phenomenally well because of all the craziness for a month about this whole story um and i it should serve her well and she totally deserves that charlotte's follow-up question was about um did her book get into the libraries yes and i i just want to add on about my experience is that librarians are being like super badass and tough about bringing in controversial books um, because they want their young readers to see people like them in books, whatever that may be. And they are so aware that there's a giant spectrum of, you know, um, you know, neurodivergency, ethnic groups, um, you know, everybody along this, the spectrum of gender, all those things are really, librarians, especially at the public libraries are just bring, bringing those books in. The problem is that in school libraries, there are um, parents who go to the principal or you know some of the administrators in, in the public schools, and then they sort of come up with a list of books that they want banned. And then they go to the librarians and put the librarians in a really tough position. Because 
my experience is that all librarians for young people really want all kinds of books out there so all kids can feel like I see myself in a book. It, it depends on the state because I know that librarian in Tennessee who represents the Tennessee school librarians and she spent like months like two years ago like in like in in her state house because they were trying to pass a law that if you had a controversial book and it was in your library it would be a felony and so she spent all this time trying to prevent that law from being passed and um so you see examples you know not 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 in blue states but you see examples where the librarian stands up and then they defund the library or they make it like not a felony, but like pretty close. So then the librarian has no choice but to pull books that they think might be controversial because, you know, like their their livelihood is at stake. So it's it's a whole range depending on where you live and what kind of laws they are passing. Laurence. Yeah, something you said, Mia, really took me back. You said, like, I, first of all, I thought this was amazing. Oh, really, really interesting. Um, and that's the thing, because you said, oh, it's very specific, so they wouldn't be interested. But that's the point. It's a book like this. It's not, not just, yes, kids should see themselves in it, but also kids who are not this should see this. Yeah. So that this is more of the norm. And so I think it's not just about kids seeing themselves in books, which yes, they should, but other kids who aren't that should see this. Yeah, we so there's that it's a whole, there's normalized. A whole thing in children's books, a woman, I forget her name, who coined like uh, mirrors, uh, was it mirrors, windows, and sliding doors. So a mirror, you see yourself, a, a door, you see people that are not like you and then sliding doors to see sort of um, like a fantasy worlds. And like hundred percent, that's hundred percent right. What you're saying. Cause I really think like this should not be, oh, this is a niche book. This should be like this and the other ones. Cause, cause the thing about this is I was reading through and some of the names I recognized and some of them I didn't. I thought these are amazing people. Why haven't I heard more about them? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's why that's the books that, that I'm writing. Uh, I have two biographies coming out. Same thing. Why, why don't they have their own story? You know, and it's because it's because publishing is ninety percent white and female librarians, ninety percent white and female teachers, ninety percent white and female. So you have this ecosystem that has always had the dominant voice, and publishers thinking, unless you're a brown girl, you don't want to read a book about a brown girl. And so that whole myth. And then, you know, they don't spend much money marketing it, so then it doesn't do very well. So that whole myth got, you know, perpetuated and supported until like groups, and literally only like five to seven years ago, started to explode it. And then you started to see change like five to seven years ago with the with the big awards and Newberry and the Caldecott. For the first time, you see more women win winning and, you know, more minority groups. And then once you win those awards, your books sell more. And then finally that, that myth of what sells gets destroyed. Well, you know, I'm not a hobbit, but I like the Lord of the Rings. No, I know, I know. So, so you know? Lisa had a, a question, which I was gonna ask a form of, and that had, that's sort of how do you work with your illustrators? Um, how do you team up with the illustrators? Um, how much direction, particularly um, Mia in, in this one, did you give to your illustrators There's a lot of sort of um, fun uh, Easter eggs in the illustrations? And Beth, um, you know, is is the design? Did you give a lot of direction on the design? How how do you how did you find the illustrator? How do you work with them? Because it's it's clearly a a, a cooperative medium, right? Right. So I've done the whole range. So Sumo Joe, they chose the illustrator, but. Like, honestly, he was amazing. And there was no direct contact with us until the book was done. And that is a little bit more typical because they don't want the illustrator to be overly influenced. But I was allowed to see, you know, thumbnails and uh, rough drafts. I was able to get feedback throughout, um, you know. And did, um, and did you did you give the, the script and 
without directions about page breaks or what the picture should look like or it, Tom will, I think, um, appreciate the, the Marvel method versus the DC method, sort of full script for comic books or sort of very loose outline and let the artists do what they want. So I, I always have my manuscripts chunked into like, and I think in spreads, like a two page spread. Um, but, you know, obviously it changes once the editor gets involved and once the illustrator gets involved. So I had, I had a spread where I was like, like, this spread is so funny. I'd have Sumo Joe and his sister, like, you know, close up because their faces look identical, but she's got a ponytail. Um, but they're, you know, one's huge and one's tiny. And it was like this visual joke. And everyone was like, oh yeah, that's so funny. That's like great. But then it was like, no, now that we have the illustrator, his style doesn't really lend to like a close up. So like, we're going to have to cut that. And I was like, oh my God, like kills me. But, but then he added this visual pond at the end, which wasn't even my idea. Like the way the book ended is like with a pillow fight because they build a ring with pillows. And I was like, that wasn't in the book. Like he thought of that. And like, that's a, such a funny like riff too. Like I, I thought that was amazing. Um, for the second one, my second picture was this. Um, so they hired the illustrator and I, I saw thumbnails, but like, honestly, his, his sketch style is like so scribbly. It's like really hard to tell, like, like what, what it's, it's so different. Like this guy's an animator. So you see the rough and it looks exactly like the finished, like just with color. And this guy, you see scribbles and the end result is like day and night different. But I, but because my publisher is much smaller, like there were a lot of errors, like where I, he didn't do the research about like, how does this farm work? Like, for example, we had a farm set in Senegal and he put in a lion. And I was like, okay, the lion's really cute, but I just looked it up because I'm not an expert either. But they're like, no, there are no lions in Senegal, you know? So I was like, you can put in like a, a, a cheetah or you can put in, you know, but like, don't add a lion just on your own because like, that's inaccurate. So there were a lot of corrections that I had to like, literally like sit on people. Like, this is wrong. Can you fix it? Because um, also he does more traditional uh, with like digital editions and, and his, just, his process is really, he's just really, really slow. And so our book got delayed because it just, you know, took forever. And then I have another picture book called a uh, boxer baby battles bedtime. And I want, I didn't want to be like, I had submitted it and I got um, like a really good publisher actually, who said like, we really love it. It's perfect. We would have bought it, but we have two boxing books, picture books coming out. And so we can't have a third. And I was like, that's so nice. Like that's my best rejection ever. But I was, I was like, I don't want to be the seventh boxing picture book because that's, that's too late. Cause boxing, I box, boxing is the biggest fitness trend in America. It's bigger than spinning. It's bigger than yoga. So I was like, I just need to get my book out there. So I'm going to uh, go with this tiny, tiny publisher where I had to find and hire my own illustrator, which I did because my I used my daughter's friend from RISD, who's an illustration major. And then because, the, because of that, I was intimately involved, like at one point, even art directing when my like editor like didn't make the call because we would meet every six weeks so they didn't show up so I was like art director you know um so it's it's the gamut but um my my agent says like like now that you're more established you have the right to give feedback on illustration they have you know they have to have you approve the illustrator and have you have more input into it and I was like I love that because I I like getting involved Yeah, and I can I can add um, that traditionally for a picture book, um, what is expected is the writer to like write a typewritten thing with traditional paragraphs and not even say where you think the page break should be and let the editor and the illustrator that they choose without necessarily involving the writer be creative in that way. Um, that has not been my experience on any of my books. Uh, I think partially because I do have experience in art direction and design. Um, so I know better and, and, and make comments along the way. Uh, and also because publishing is changing and people are really, really busy and exhausted and overwhelmed. And if you can provide them with something that's more finished, they are 
more likely to go with that one. Um, so um, that said, I, I, I will show you some, I'll, I'll show you some of my other books and, and the picture stories. So these books, I hate reading in the book. No one wants to read. These, oh, I guess these are the same. Well, anyways, the, I hate reading these very similar graphics. I actually worked with my brother-in-law who is an awesome graphic designer on it. And the two of us sat there together <laughs> next to the computer and, and created every page. Um, and so we like just like designed it together, um, which was super cool. And then what, then I self-published them. I actually was just doing this for fun, waiting to hear from other books that I submitted. Um, and these did so, so is your well. brother-in-law headquarters? Is he, is yes. he headquarters? Yes. Okay. That's the name of his design agency in Seattle. Um, yeah. He, he is awesome. His name is Corey Hale. Um, but he likes to do like, you know, not, he's not really into children's books. And after we did these, he was like, I'm done. You got to find other people to work with. Um, but it was awesome to work with them at the time. Uh, and then they sold so well as self-published books, then HarperCollins took them and now they um, sell them, which is great because I don't like the distribution marketing side of it. So I would way rather would have them do this than me. Um, this book is a nonfiction book about pandas. I did with my friend, Anne, who is a fine artist and she loves pandas. And so, oh, wait a minute. Is my, is there something wrong with the um, video? Oh, I, I, I'm, who is, who's called iPhone? Is there somebody on there called iPhone? Is that my iPhone? I think so. There Anyways, is. that's, yeah. oh, there, there we go. It just wasn't showing um, the speaker. And since I'm recording it, I, anyways, all good. Um, so we did this one together and then we sent it out to publishers. She, her agent and my agent happened to work at the same agency. So that was really helpful. Um, this one is also done by HarperCollins and it is like a mini um, graphic novel format like this. I don't know if you can see. Um, and the illustrator who we had no input in choosing um, designed it as like a regular picture book. And in like every page was like a different scene, like at a playground or at an art class. And it like made no sense. And you read it and you're like, the pictures and the words don't make any sense together. You know, we had always envisioned it as a, graphic novel. So it was really um, a difficult and fraught several months to talk about it. And and finally the editor and art director at, at Harper agreed with us. And, and then they're like, yeah, but I don't know what you mean. And so like, I literally like laid it all out. And then we gave a, a sketch of this to the illustrator and he was like, oh yeah, now I get it. So that was really interesting and strange. Um, this one is the Santa book is hilarious because the um, it started off as a Spanish version of the night before Christmas story. And the author ended up, they found out that the author plagiarized the text after all the pictures were made. And my friend who works for this publisher was talking about it. And I was like, these illustrations are awesome. And I was like, how about if you give me the illustrations and I like rearrange them and just write a whole different book so you can use the illustrations and, and I'll just like, I don't know, it'll be some other story. And she's like, well, what? And I was like, just let me try. And if you like it, then you can turn it into a book. If you don't like it, then I'm just out the time that I spent working on it. So they liked it. And so now it's a book. So there's all kinds of weird things that can happen with illustrations. I think that that's a place in publishing that there's changes because you know, 10 years ago, it was like writers and uh, and illustrators do not work together. And, you know, it's the editor's privilege to, to add the creativity and work with the art director and work with the illustrator separate from the illustrator and, I mean, separate from the writer. And they don't have time for that anymore, I think. Um, they want good ideas wherever they come from. So 
like so. when you do a picture book manuscript, like you you can do illustration notes, like you know wherever, like on the page, uh, whatever section you want. But like the general advice is, just do as few as possible, you know, because really only to clarify confusion, because it, you just one you look like a control freak, and two it just it limits the illustrator, and you know it's just kind of like annoying. Yeah, a lot of it is is also just like working with people and being creative and and like saying, we're all a team. Let's figure this out. You know, so. So Beth, a, a question. Have you gotten any feedback from librarians that kids are actually, you know, using this as their 20 minute reading and think they're getting away with not reading stuff? Because it was so cute and fun um, that like conspiratorial, like, oh, we're going to. We're going to move our eyes one direction and nobody's going to know you're not really reading, even though you're reading. Do you do you get any feedback? But, but yeah, the, the best is love it, read, so. yeah, when I hear it's like, oh, this kid who like sometimes I go into schools and do readings and and there's one that I had gone in the year before and um, one of the librarians said, see that little girl over there, she never picked up a book and your book was sitting on a table and she wandered over and looked at it and and read it and then all of a sudden she started checking out books and so I think that like very quietly it it gives kids permission to have had a hard time learning to read and then they're like hey I got through that and I laughed and it was a book maybe there are other books that will make me laugh too so yeah the best thing that I hear about that book is that they just move on to other books and that's what, I, that's the best, you know? That's they, fantastic. They start reading, yeah. But it, it it's because it um, it makes them feel, it makes their, it, it validates their experience as reluctant readers. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I can, maybe I can open up another book. Pam, was that a wave or were you raising your hand? Well, Charlotte had a question and I think, Beth should answer it because it's more YA. I don't I don't blog on YA. I don't write YA. Uh, let's see. It, uh, I have noticed that movies now have much more violence and less sex and less sexism than when we were children. For example, old Star Trek versus new Star Trek. What do you think have happened in books? Uh, interesting. Um, I guess I would say that I think for YA books, YA is young adult, and that's like for high school kids. I actually think they have more sex and more like intimate stuff. And to some extent, they will talk about things like drug addiction in a really um, deep and, and precise way. Um, I don't know about violence particularly, but I do know about like dating and 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 drugs and stuff like that has become like like they're kind of there's a lot of they they are very honest, you know, which I think is is as they should be. Um, but a lot of people think, oh, my teen isn't ready for that. But like you know, oh, like, and they have the whole internet that they can look at at any time. Um, so I think that's interesting. And I think that with sexism, um, I think that our whole culture has been like, there. I, I think it, that with the Me Too and everything, I think that people are more aware of it and and they are trying, like, it's just not, it's, it's just cringy to have something that's like really sexist. And so that's not really happening in YA. Um, I think with like picture books, also there's lots of really cool things. Um, like I just I don't have a lot of books here because I just moved, but um this book, Molly's Tuxedo, is about a little girl who wants to wear a tuxedo on picture day at, in kindergarten. And so like there's just a lot more things that are going that are out there that that maybe wouldn't have been, you know, publishers wouldn't have been aware of before. Um does that kind of answer your question about more why, violence? Why is a sense? weird category too? Because like technically it's 14 and up. But you see some YA defined as 12 years old and up. But if you look at the category itself, it's 50% adults and 50%, you know, 12 or 14, like high school, you know, so it's, 
it's kind of because they're really good. There's so many really well written yeah, yeah. books. Yeah, I, I kept I kept reading them after our kids sort of moved on. Read yeah. them together when they were 14 and 15, and now I'm still stuck reading some of them. But I read comic books every week anyway, so I'm not a good example. Well, picture books are for everyone too. It's for every age. So uh, Cheryl's comment about Love Boat Taipei. Do you know um, Abby Wen, who wrote that, went to Harvard? Do you guys know that? Um, she um, and she is the book is is becoming a movie that's coming out real soon. I just saw on Facebook, so we'll see what the movie is like compared to the um, the book. But yeah, I mean, I think that Love Boat Taipei is a modern YA book in terms of its you know um, details and you know, honesty and, and whatnot. So, but yeah, I think that maybe we can have Abby come in and, and be a, uh, a speaker, even though she was, I don't know if she, I think she's like one or two years behind us at Harvard. I'm not sure. Well, so. your follow-up question, Charles, I feel like books and movie are sort of lockstep. Like we were both fighting for diversity and change kind of at the same time, um, you know, bear up at arms about AI. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a little bit lockstep, I feel like. I mean, with Crazy Rich Asians, that was the first Asian movie that broke out um, and that opened a whole new category. So in that sense, they were a little bit behind because there were a lot of Asian American books before that for kids, but in general, I feel like, yeah, we're all, it's, it's sort of the same thing about who gets represented. Now oh, Pam does like... have, yeah, Pam. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm wondering, can you talk about your, your favorite book that you wrote? It's like having children, like you can't have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a favorite book that um, is self-published. I haven't been able to get um, anyone to publish it, so I just self-published it. It's called Blank Space, and it's sort of on the um, the philosophy of these books for kids that don't like to read. And it's it's a story of a, a little kid whose favorite that she's asked, or he. I don't, it doesn't have a gender in the book. the The kid is asked. Um, what is your favorite part of a, any book? And, and this kid says, my favorite part of any book is the blank space. And it uses concrete poetry where like the words sort of like, if it's a picture, if she's talking about a diving board, it looks like a diving board or snowflakes or a mountain or whatever. Um, and there's tons of blank space in the book. And um, it's just near and dear to my heart because like, I, when I was a kid, I would read and I would read slowly and I would think about things in between. And, and like, if it was a mystery, I was like, what happened between the end of that chapter and the beginning of this chapter? And I would imagine it. And, and that's what I believe. Like, I believe that as readers, we co-create the stories we read so much more than with movies, we have to make it up in our mind. And, and some of the best books are, are really awesome because they don't, tell you how the characters are feeling. You have to put it together. You put together their responses um, by all the other clues that are in, in the actions of the characters. And so it's sort of like my like love letter to like reading as a kid. Um, the reason why reading is, is so wonderful is because you in the blank space help build the book. So you guys can go on Amazon and go find it. I don't even think I have a copy of it here um, for you to see, but that's definitely my favorite book of all that I've ever written. I, I think my best book is actually coming out in 2025. It's called Postcards for Malcolm X. And it's really the story of Yuri Kochiyama, who is a Japanese American activist. And I had wanted to write about her for a really long time and had read her like biography. And I just couldn't figure out like, because sort of like people knew her because she was the person that Malcolm X, when he died, like it was on her lap. So people kind of knew her, but didn't know her. And there was nothing really like you could hang an achievement around her because she never led an organization or, you know, she never front and center. And so when I finally figured out I was going to tell the story 
of their like sort of their friendship and their mentorship, which was only like a 16 month period. Like, I mean, it took me years to figure it out and then it all came together. And I feel like, I feel like that's, that's probably my best book. And that probably is my most commercial book. So maybe the one I worked the hardest on, you know, like just draft after draft. I see another question. It says, if you told your Harvard self in 1983 that you would have written these books, how would you have reacted in 1983? Yes, that's I'm reading right. So I don't know, Mia, do you have an answer to that? You know, I was history and science because I was pre-med and I just wanted to be able to take humanities classes. And I would have switched majors because one, I wouldn't have been pre-med because I hated science and I wasn't great at it. And, you know, there's so few electives if you're pre-med, even history and science. So I think I would have been like EAS, you know, or English even, or some combination. So like, that's, I guess my regret or like my do-over, that's what I would have done. It, I guess I would say that back in 1983, I was, I, I was a literature major with a French concentration. And so I loved like, you know, super long, like novels from the 18th century. And I'm surprised that I have this children's book, like direction, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised because like my, my job that I had on the weekends was that I worked at the Boston Children's Museum. And in the summer, I was always a camp counselor. Like I loved kids, like, but I never really thought of it as like, oh, this is a career. Um, so it is kind of an interesting combination of the things that I loved, which is reading um, and kids. But also it's like, it's like a career that you have to have another job. Like most of us in children's books, we have to have another source of income if we're dependent on this because it just, it pays so little. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the average, the average um, children's book sells about 7,000 copies. Um, and, you know, your, your advances commiserate with that. I mean, I've, I've had some high um, advances. Advancing is basically what you get. You paid in advance when they say, yeah, we want to publish it. And then you get royalties after it. If after the book makes that much money, then they will give you a little bit for every additional book that sells. Um, so most of the time you just say like, okay, my advance is the payment for this book. Um, in some event, like I, some of these really small publishers, the advance is as small as like 5,000, 500 or a thousand dollars, you know, on up to several tens of thousands for the bigger publishers. But still like, if you sell one book a year, you can't live off of it. Yeah, so, no, there's yeah. Like, there, there, like Karen, like there's an author in my neighborhood who I know and she's, you know, very dear friend. And she was like, and, and she had a five book deal with like a big, um, big publisher and like a very well known editor. And she was like, I make 40,000 a year, you know, every year, like that's it. So and they husband, dump all the marketing um, costs right? and time on you as the author. So but then I know another that. author who like, you know, like her books are literally like the book in the school, like the whole school reads it. And she was like, if I made 40,000 a year, I'd be like dancing the happy dance. You know, when you're like 40,000 is below the poverty line, you know, you can't live on 40,000, like, and live in anywhere, like, but especially Newton, you know? And so it's like 40,000 is like aspirational for us. That's not a lot. It's the same thing here. It's the same thing here. I know for my, for my friends who are full-time children's writers, they do school trips they do, you know, book tours, they do everything else. Um, and again, it's going back to the initial point. I think there's a, there's a certain group of careers where people go, oh, it must be easier or rewarding. Therefore, that's enough. You don't need to get paid. And I think with children's writing, it's that thing of that you said, Beth, oh, it's for kids. You so do kids and love it, you know, it. like that's your own yeah. word. Kids will read it. We don't have to. Yeah. How hard <laughs> can it be? 
I think a lot about the uh, economics of publishing because I've been trying to figure it out, you know, going from like high tech in Seattle to this has been like, what, where is the justice in the world? But one of the things is, so a book costs a lot of money to print. Like this is, this is like 120 pages of full color. And, um, you know, they sell it for $11, but really it sells about like seven or $8 sometimes on Amazon. Um, and the economics are just really, really hard. Like, it's not like digital stuff where you can just like replicate it and, and sell it or subscriptions that you get the same amount every month. And like this book, there's not a lot of profit margin in it. And then who has to share that little tiny profit margin is like the editor, the publisher, the illustrator, the writer, like all those people have to share this little tiny amount. So like, I don't know how to change the economics of colorful picture books. And that's and if why you, other genres are more profitable because, you know, like an adult nonfiction can sell for 35 bucks. There's no illustration. It's not in color. You know, you don't have to pay for an illustrator. Just yeah. Book. And if you're thinking like, OK, 7000 oh, copies. Margins. Yes. If 7000 copies is the average that that's you don't have any economics of scale. You know, it's just expensive. So I don't I wish I knew and it's probably 5000 copies just to break even. Cause that's the first print run and that's like yeah. not discounting it because if it doesn't do well then they just dump it you know yeah so if anyone can figure out like how to crack the code on making it a, a you know it's a really movie. like direct you know what i mean you need a, a big enough audience that you make the book yourself and you sell it directly and you you know you're like seth godin or whatever like you can sell a million copies on your own but that's that's the hard trick to pull off. That's, you know, you have to, we have to disintermediate the publishing, you know, and it's possible because it's print on demand, you know, and, you know, you can. But print you know, on demand for this is so much more expensive because I did print on demand and then I went to HarperCollins. Yeah. This print on demand is like 30 bucks and HarperCollins can print it at, in larger quantities and sell it for eight to ten dollars so right but, but if you but if you have hard. the pre-orders you can get it printed yeah. for five dollars a pop including yeah. you know shipping by boat but then you if have i had pre-orders yeah. you have to oh, warehouse so the, it, yeah, you, ship you it said, individually yeah you said you got the the junior library guild i can't remember the number of libraries you said that 1200 yeah 1200 okay. 1200 yeah so that's that gets you towards the five thousand, but not yeah. It doesn't but it's do nice because it. you get in right away. Yeah. So it's um it's 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 super helpful. All right. Well, a, a couple people have have dropped off, and it, it's a little past thirty. Um, so I was thinking maybe we would wrap stuff up a little bit. Um, but thank you guys so much. Uh, we have um, a December date with, I think, Lisa's book. Lisa may be someone who dropped it off. And a February date with a novel, uh, not a novel, a nonfiction book um, called Competing with Idiots. And I can't remember the guy who wrote it. Um, but October is still open, so I'll work on trying to get something for that. But if anyone has great ideas, just email me. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming and keep going. Um, but, you know. Thank you. That was so that was Thank you for coming. Really interesting. This Thank you so fun. much. Congratulations. Th th thanks for the awesome questions. Yeah. Thank you, thanks for hosting as always. You always do a great job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, Bye. everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. I'm the one that can end it, so I will end it when I see all of you guys gone. Oh, I guess I will end it. Bye.